Baptist Church. Glad you guys are here today. And I want to start off by reading us some scripture this morning, and then we're going to sing a song together. You can turn in your hymn books to page number 201, and we're going to sing this great song today called More About Jesus. And honestly, that's what we want this service to be about. We want it to be all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he is the one whom we praise and adore today. He is our Savior, our Rescuer, our Deliverer. We have hope in Him today, and we just rejoice in our great God. And I, I want to read just a few verses of Scripture from Colossians chapter 1, where the Bible says in Colossians 1.12, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, in, uh, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And that's our prayer today, is that Jesus would be high and lifted up, and that he would have preeminence in our hearts and in this midst today. So grab your hymn books and turn to page 201, and we're going to sing this song together this morning, More About Jesus, and this ought to be our prayer today. Let's sing it out together on page number 201. Ready? More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. See. More of his love who died for me. On the second verse. More about Jesus, let me learn more of his holy will discern. Spirit of God, my teacher be, showing the things of Christ to me. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. See. More of his love who died for me. On the third verse, sing it out. More about Jesus in his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. See. More of his love who died for me. That's what we need more of today. Not more money, uh, not more wisdom or intellect. Uh, we need more about Jesus. Let's sing that last verse. More about Jesus on his throne. That's where he is today, by the way. He's on his throne. And so let's sing that page number 201 on the fourth verse. Let's sing it together. Ready? More about Jesus on his throne. 
Riches in glory all his own. More of his kingdom sure increase. More of his coming prince of peace. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Amen. I hope that'll be our prayer today. More about Jesus. Matt is going to come and welcome us with a psalm today. Thank you for being here this morning. Baptist Church, we are so glad to have you here this morning, this beautiful morning. I know it was a hot week for a lot of us, but uh, praise God for the sunshine here in Southern California. And again, we're glad to have you here. And for those tuning in via live stream, we welcome you as well and hope you all had a great week. Also, i um, excited to get into uh, what Pastor has in store for us today. And so uh, I'll go ahead and open us up in our psalm this morning, which comes out of Psalm chapter 68, which we were in last week. But we'll start in verse 19 this week go throughout uh, verse 35 if you want to follow on the screen. It says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Selah. He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. The God shall wound the head of his enemies, and the hairy scalp of such one as goeth on still in his trespasses. The Lord said, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea that the foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. They have seen thy goings, O God, even the goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary. The singers went before, the players on instruments followed after. Among them were the damsels playing with timbrels. Uh, bless ye God in the congregations, even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. There is little Benjamin with their ruler, the prince of Judah and their council, the princes of Zebulun and the princes of Naphtali. Thy God hath commanded thy strength. Strengthen, O God, that which thou hast wrought for us. Because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. Rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of the bulls, with the calves of the people, till every one submit himself with the pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God. Sing unto God, ye kingdoms of the earth. O sing praises unto the Lord. Selah. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. Ascribe ye strength unto God, his excellency is over Israel, and his strength is in the clouds. O God, thou art terrible. Out of thy holy places, the God of Israel, is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just thank you so much um, for today. Lord, we thank you that you were able to gather your people here under this roof. Father, and for those who might be out or for those who might be uh, visiting or uh, being with us through live stream, Father, I pray that their spirit is with us today as well, God. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that he dwells within us, Father, and is present in this place today, Lord. I do pray that your um, will would be done today, Father, and we know that your will today is for us to uh, enjoy a time of um, just worship, Father, enjoy a time of fellowship before and after the service and enjoy a time of being under your word, Lord. I do pray that, that your words would speak mightily in this place today, Father. Lord, that uh, ears would hear the message that you have for us, Lord, but that our hearts would be changed as well, Father. Lord, our hearts would be receptive um, to whatever it have, you have in store for us today, God. Lord, the desire, the outcome of, of today, Lord, would change lives, Father, and I do pray that you would do that here in this place, God. So, Lord, as we enter into this time of singing praise unto you, Lord, I pray that we would sing from our, our mouths, but more importantly, that we would sing from hearts, Lord. God, we love you so much, and again, we ask for all these things in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's a wonderful privilege to be at Haven Baptist Church today, to be here in God's house, so I welcome you again. We're going to lift our voices together. We're also going to stand to our feet. We're going to sing some praises to our God. Right before we start, the psalm, chapter number five, says this. 
Let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. We are God's people today. He is here in our midst today. Let's sing to him, worship his name, for he's preeminent in this place. then who can be against us? It's a reality, God, that you are for us. It's true that you are for us. As we've heard already this morning, the goal of this gathering today is for us, your people, to see our Savior lifted up in this place today. As we sing, as we worship, as we dive into your word, I pray that the end result, the end goal, the purpose of it all is preeminence for the name of Jesus Christ. For in that name we have hope. In that name we have peace. 
In that name, we have salvation. And our salvation is secure in Christ. You have a name that is, that is above every other name. And soon and very soon, every knee will bow to that name. We bow willingly today. We lift our attention and our focus to a God who is faithful and a God who is true. When we fail and we do fail, you are our protector, you are our shield, you are a refuge, a strong tower, you are an anchor that we can settle our lives upon, the rock of our salvation. You are our hope today, you are our God today, you are good today. We love you. We need you. We look for you. Thank you, God, for being present with us. Help us, strengthen us by your Spirit. Build us up in our most holy faith. Faith that is anchored in the person of Jesus Christ. For you are the invisible God made visible. You are the God of heaven and the God of earth. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being here today. We love you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. church.
God, those words are true. It is a faithful saying. What we just sang together, what we encouraged and admonished one another with, what we lifted to heaven as praise to you is true. You give life to us. We don't possess life. Adam, our earthly father, the first man did not possess life. Life is in you. And you, God, formed and created a body. And then the scripture says that you breathed into that body life. The breath of life. Scripture tells us then that man, that man, Adam, in that moment, when he received your breath, he became a living soul. God, everything in this world that moves, that lives, has life and breath because of you. Paul declared that in one of his messages where he says, in him, in Christ, we both live and move and we have our being. So we don't have to be confused about why we're here today. We don't have to wonder about our identity or our existence or if there is purpose for us here. For we are here for one reason. And it is to stand in awe and wonder of you, God. For you alone have life. You alone are God and you alone are good. So may we, God, today in a very real way since receive again the fullness of the Spirit of God. Lord, we do have physical life, but I'm praying today that we would receive spiritual life today. Lord, if we know you, if we have a relationship with you, may we be filled today, strengthened today, encouraged today by your Spirit. If there are those among us who do not know you, have never placed faith in your finished work, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. We love you. We thank you for being the source of all life. We ask, God, that you would receive glory and praise from these unworthy people. Lord, I count myself as part of that group. We're all unworthy people. But we come into the presence of a worthy God. And we give that worthy God worthy praise. You are good and you are God. May we believe that today. May we stand on that today. Thank you for life, the life that's in your son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. seated. Thank you for standing and singing this morning. What a great time of worship we've already enjoyed today. The Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Uh, I was reminded this week and actually challenged a little bit because sometimes we say, Lord, we invite you to come. Well, he's here. He's here. He's with us. The Bible says that he never leaves us or forsakes us. If we're believers, the Holy Spirit is always with us. We don't have to invite him to come, but you know what we can do? We can invite him to, to work in our midst today. And, uh, man, I'm so thankful for that great song this morning. And we, we talked about that in the teen class this morning. We, we talked about the fact that the reason why we exist today, uh, thank you, Miss Gigi, the reason why we exist today is uh, for relationship. Number one, relationship with God, but he also created us with a desire to have relationship with one another. And so we have a purpose for living today. I'm so glad you're here. It's good to be together today. We've got a number of people that are out and sick or out of town today. We need to pray for them. I'll give you a few people to pray for this morning. Uh, church family, uh, one, uh, please pray for Miss Loreen. Uh, she was uh, uh, scheduled to be in the hospital last night for an evaluation. And so that's why they're not here this morning. So please pray for Miss Loreen. And if you can, maybe reach out to her or Don, tell them we're praying for them. Also pray for Miss Christine. She was able to come home this week, but she's still uh, still under the weather and you know trying to recuperate really from her uh, surgery. And so if you would please pray for Miss Christine 
And then also pray for Miss Nancy. We haven't seen Miss Nancy in a long time, but she watches faithfully every single week uh, the live stream, and she's in the hospital right now. Um, and so please pray for Miss Nancy this morning, if you would. She may be watching right now, but uh, please pray for these. And then the Cannings are out of town today, and it's summer season, so people are starting to go on vacation and different things like that. But I'm glad you're here today. I'm so happy to see you here this morning. And I believe God has something for us if we'll be ready to receive it. Carl's going to come and welcome you today to the service, give you a few uh, new announcements and some upcoming events. And so we're going to welcome him up here this morning. All right, well, good morning, church. Good morning, Carl. <laughs> it's always great to hear those kids upstairs with the echo. Um, good morning, church. Hopefully you are having a uh, great day today uh, so far. And uh, again, as Pastor said, thank you for worshiping with us today, uh, especially those of you that are joining us via the live stream. Um, you may be a guest on the live stream. We actually have a connection card uh, that you can fill out virtually if you go to our website, havensc.church. Uh, uh, fill out whatever information you feel comfortable uh, filling out. We just want to make record um, of your visit. And then um, as Pastor kind of went over a couple of uh, prayer requests, um, if you have a specific prayer request, uh, whether you are online or here in person, if you fill out one of our connection cards down at the bottom, uh, again, like I always say, we'd love to come around you um, and pray uh, for you um, for the uh, good and the bad. So uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, fill that out and make sure to, um, yeah. All right, a um, couple of announcements. Um, so number one, uh, don't forget our home groups. We've actually already started. If you still would like to get plugged in, uh, wondering how you can get plugged in, if you plugged in, if you go to our website, um, uh, havenetc.church, uh, it's basically fellowshipping, food, and then uh, some, uh, 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 some challenges um, from the person leading uh, the group. Uh, so once again, uh, it's on Tuesdays at 7, so if you'd like to get um, connected with that, um, register or talk to pastor about that. i um, not sure this was announced last week, but um, the boys and the men, so men and boys, um, we're going to have a camp out on the 16th through the 18th um, up in uh, Canyon View uh, Campground in Hume. Um, it is $30 each uh, for each person. Um, it includes the fee for the campsite and for meals. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, get plugged in, men and boys, you go to our website, havensc.church, and um, register for that. And then teens, if you have yet to sign up, you have until the 26th uh, to pay your uh, to pay your fee uh, for that. So uh, the teens are going on um, on their uh, their teen camp um, the 27th through uh, July uh, 2nd, and then um, to help the teens uh, raise funds for uh, their tu uh, tuition for their fee, um, we are having a bake sale today. Uh, so don't forget to uh, check out um, all the goodies that the teens have uh, have made, and then. I've actually noticed for a while, um, but I guess this is the first time we're mentioning it, but um, in the back of the, uh, of the uh, church back there, there's an evangelism table. Um, I know a pastor is trying to get out um, these door hangers. Um, so, so basically there's door hangers and then some maps. Um, if you just want to grab one, um, spend an hour or so um, just passing those out. Um, and also some gospel tracks. Um, uh, um, you know, we want to go and uh, spread the word about um, just the word in general and then about our church. So if you... Uh, uh, feel led to uh, pass those out. Just um, stop by the table there and see uh, see what we got. And um, Pastor's going to come up and uh, give us our offering challenge for the week. Of that evangelism or outreach table in the back, we have brand new tracks back there. Um, they've been back there for a couple weeks, but I haven't mentioned those. Uh, something that I've been burdened about recently is having a good uh, gospel presentation that we can distribute in our community, not just a door hanger that has kind of a, a 30,000 foot view of the gospel, but I have put some brochures back there uh, that I really want to encourage you to take a stack of those um, and just keep them with you. Uh, this week we were out to eat um, and we gave one to our waitress and uh, maybe you're at the grocery store and you give one to the person who's checking you out, but have that gospel literature with you so you can give those to your friends, your family, your neighbors, people that you're coming in contact with, and that would be a great way for, for you to be a witness this week. I want you to uh, take note of Proverbs uh, chapter 21 this morning. And I'm going to read a, a small portion of scripture as we get ready to worship the Lord through giving our tithes and our offerings. And I believe this. I believe that Christians ought to be the most generous people in the world. The Bible says in Proverbs 21 verses 25 through 26, The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. 
he coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. I read this week from John Gill, who said, The slothful man covets, as he has nothing to do to employ his time and his thoughts with. He's always craving something to eat and drink, or wishing that he had such an estate, or so much wealth and riches, that he might live as such and such persons do. And this is what his head runs upon all the day long. But the righteous giveth and spareth not. Not gives to the slothful, which does not restrain his desire, but to the poor and the necessitous, to proper objects. A good man will work with his hands that he may have a sufficiency for himself and his family and may have something to give to others that are in want, and he spares not or withholds not his hands, neither from working nor from giving. And I hope that would be the heart of our church family as we give each and every week. Uh, I was thinking about it like this this week. Every week when we give our tithes and offerings, it's giving us an opportunity to remind ourselves that I am to be a generous person, not to be taking what I have and holding it close and holding on to it tight, but realizing that God has called me once a week to open my hands and give an offering. And I believe as we give an offering to the Lord today, it will inspire us to be more giving because the Bible says it's more blessed to, to give than to receive. So let's be a generous people today. Let me invite you to worship God today through your tithes and offerings. You can give online at easytithe.com slash haven, or you can give today in person at the back of our uh, auditorium. There is a, a safe giving box there with some envelopes, and we invite you to worship the Lord in giving today. Let's bow in prayer and thank God for this opportunity. Lord, it's a blessed privilege for us to give today. Lord, we are so thankful that you have blessed us and have given to us, and that's why we can give back. Because you have given uh, to us. And we said it a moment ago, it's your breath in our lungs. Lord, as Timothy said, in you we live and we move and we have our being. And at the end of the day, everything we accomplished this week was all because of you. You gave us the strength and the ability, the intellect, the knowledge, the understanding to accomplish the things that you've called us to do. And Lord, the things that we have taken upon ourselves to do. And we thank you for that, Lord, and we know that it ultimately comes from you. And so now we worship you by giving back 10% of what you have get so graciously given to us. Help us to be cheerful givers, uh, not giving uh, grudgingly because we feel like we just have to, but giving because we desperately want to. Uh, Lord, loving you from our heart, knowing that where our treasure is, there will our heart be also. Uh, Lord, continue to work in our hearts as we sing this morning and as we get ready to jump into the message today. Speak to us, we ask. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
temptation comes my way. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my open sin. Sing it together, church. Lord, I need Lord, I need been stirred in my heart this morning by the songs that we have sung because they are true we do have life in you we started Lord this morning with that beautiful hymn then we sang about joy and thanksgiving in your house we acknowledge that everything that we have is a gift from you and then Lord we conclude our worship by telling you that we need you. Lord, that's humbling to admit that we are needy people. But God, you pour water on those that are thirsty. When we draw nigh to God, you draw nigh to us. And so Lord, if we entered this place today with any other posture, then I pray right now that we would repent because God, we do need you. If we had a mountaintop week and things are looking up and things are falling into place and we came in with excitement, that's fine. That's good. But God, when we're on top of the mountain, we need you. If we walked in today just barely here, feeling frustrated, disappointed, and upset, in the valley, we need you. For you are God, both of the mountain and the valley. And wherever we are, may that always be our declaration. That God, we need you. For we are your children. Children don't ever outgrow their parents. So help us, God, to be reminded today to receive into our own lives and hearts Lord, as we enter a new week, may we enter it knowing that we need you. Lord, I don't want to go if you're not going with me. I don't want to try to do anything if you're not doing it through me. For God, without faith, it's impossible to please you. But Lord, if we walk in the fullness of the Spirit, if we yield ourselves as instruments in your hand, you can produce mighty things with our lives. We need you. You. you are our defense. You are our Savior. You are our God. Help us, Lord, as we look into your word. May it come alive in our hearts and our minds. Teach us more about Jesus. For that is our greatest need. In his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate you leading us today in worship, and I hope that our hearts have been prepared now for the preaching of the Word of God. I have a burden on my heart today, and I, I really believe God has a message to bring to our church today through the book of Malachi, and so I invite you to turn there with me, please, Malachi chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse number 17. We are in a new collection of messages called The Day is Coming, and I'm excited about uh, what God's going to do in our hearts in these sermons, these messages from His Word. And I told you last week, I don't know how long we're going to be here. Um, we're just going to sort of let God direct our hearts 
um, but I know at least we'll be here for a couple more weeks. And so uh, I want to encourage you from Malachi chapter 3. I hope you get your Bibles out. Are you ready to hear from heaven? Amen. Amen. Uh, I love singing. Uh, I love uh, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That is an important part of what we do every Sunday. But let me tell you something. The reason why we do that is to prepare our hearts for the preaching of the word of God. I believe the Bible teaches in the, uh, the importance of preaching, and we need it, and I need it, and you need it, and so let's open our hearts to receive from heaven today. Malachi chapter 3, please look at verse number 17. Malachi is, Malachi is speaking on behalf of the Lord, and he says, And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day, when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall not leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth as, and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do, shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb. For all Israel, with the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse." Someone wisely observed that the role of a faithful messenger of God is both to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. Well, that's precisely what Malachi is doing in the closing words of his prophecy. In order to both convict the rebellious and also to comfort the remnant, Malachi, God's messenger, is reminding the nation of Israel that in fact the day is coming. More specifically, the day is coming when God is coming. We learned last week that the Old Testament prophets prophesied that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was coming to earth to redeem. And how many are thankful that that's exactly what he did? Amen. He came to earth and he lived a perfect life and died on the cross in our place, taking our sin debt, paying our sin debt, and, and securing our redemption. And we thank God that he came just as the prophets prophesied that he would. He came to earth to redeem. The New Testament preachers declared that Jesus is coming in the clouds to rapture his church. And all throughout the word of God, we find the promise that he will one day come to this earth to reign. And Malachi's message is very clear. And I want to make sure that I proclaim with the same clarity and boldness the message that Mal Malachi declared. And that is this, when the day comes when he comes, that is, when the day comes when the Lord comes, it will either be a day of great joy or a day of great judgment. And this text teaches us and reveals to us that the coming of the Lord will indeed be a day of great joy for a group of people. Who will that, who will that be a great day of joy for? We learned last week that it will be a great day of joy for his sons. And God says in Malachi 3.17, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son. For every person who has been adopted into the family of God and has become one of the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. By the way, Christ Jesus who endured the judgment of God for the sin of mankind. For all of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and have been adopted into the family of God on the day when Jesus comes, that will be a day of great joy. It will also be a day of great joy for his sanctified. He says in verse 17 of our text, that day when I make up my jewels. For every child of God who has submitted themselves to the process in which the Holy Spirit creates them in the image of Jesus Christ, that will be a day of great joy. For on that day when Jesus comes, the work that was begun in them on the day of their salvation will then be completed. And what a day that will be. Not only that, not only for his sons and his sanctified, but also, as I mentioned last week, it will be a day of great joy for his servants. God says, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth 
Him. Like the Apostle Paul, every person who is faithfully serving the Lord can look forward to His coming with joy. For on that day, He will faithfully reward those who selflessly and sacrificially served Him with their lives on this earth. Now today, I want us to go one level deeper into our Bible study today, and I want us to get a true biblical sense of just how joyful that day will be for the children of God. In our last message, we answered the question, who can look forward to God's coming with joy? And today, I want us to use our Bibles to answer this question, what will make the day of His coming a day of joy? What will make the day of His coming a day of joy? In fact, I'm going to help us learn five reasons from the text today of why the coming of the Lord will be a day of great joy for God's children. I remind you of what Paul told the Corinthians in first, uh, excuse me, the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 18. He said, comfort one another with these words. Words And I want you to know this morning that that is my mission stepping into this pulpit today is to comfort you with the reminder of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 through 13, Paul told Titus that the coming of the Lord is the blessed hope of the believer. Let's look at it in our Bibles here. First, uh, at Titus rather, Titus chapter 2 and verse number 11, the apostle Paul says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What is Paul saying to Titus in those few verses? This is what he is saying. The thing that should fill our hearts with joy and abundant happiness is when we stop to meditate upon the scriptural truth that Jesus is coming again. In fact, this week as I was studying, I was reading from Alexander McLaren, and I love his title for Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. He titled it, The Happy Hope. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. I want to, I want to remind you of the truth of the coming of the Son of God today. And I want to remind you today that this is not something that we are speculating about. This is not something that we are moderately confident about. But as Paul said to Timothy, it is our hope. It is that thing that we look forward to with joyful and confident expectation. That is the definition of the word hope. A joyful and a confident expectation. I want to try to define this so we can understand what it means. And let me tell you what hope is not. Hope is not the person who has uh, been playing the lottery. By the way, I just want to make a little note here. I don't believe that's a wise way to spend the money that God has blessed you with. It's not being a good steward. I don't believe to play the lottery. But let's just use that as an example today. We've all known someone, and maybe we've been that someone who stops by the gas station, and we buy a lottery ticket with a hope that we will strike it rich. But in the back of our mind, after that lottery ticket has been purchased, that person with hope in their heart realizes that the chances of them win winning the lottery are relatively slim. And the likely outcome is that they'll probably be going right back to work on Monday morning with millions of other people who also ended up not winning the lottery. People who go to work disappointed and frustrated because they got their hopes up and their hopes came crashing down. And then what we find in our text today is not something that could be likened to that kind of a hope, which is nothing more than a wish or a dream. That's not the type of hope that Paul was talking about in Titus chapter 2. We're talking about what the scripture calls the hope of glory, the truth of God's word that comforts us by reminding us that a better day is coming. The truth of God's word that reminds us that the days we experience here on this earth will be the worst days that we will ever experience. The hope that that in the midst of every difficult day that we experience, that God is still 
working all things together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The hope that Paul is encouraging Titus to lean into, the hope that Malachi is encouraging the nation of Israel to lean into is the truth of God's word that tells us that there is a day coming when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of Kings, will set up his kingdom and will rule and reign in righteousness. The hope that a day is coming when true justice will prevail and when every wrong will be made right. And church, I'm here to tell you this morning, that day is coming. We look forward to it with great hope, with a confident expectation. We look forward to that day and it fills our heart with great joy and happiness. Charles Ellicott said, it may be asked, what is that hope? We answer, it is the hope of glory, which, shall, which we shall share with the Son of God when we behold him as he is. Now, I need you to understand this morning, as I'm going to give you five reasons why this will be a day of great joy, that I recognize and confess before you this morning that my inability as a communicator will be on full display today. The reality is I could never paint a vivid enough picture with my words to help you grasp how great and how, how marvelous that day is going to be. I was thinking about that this week as I was preparing to preach this message, and my mind went back to September of 2014. I think we have a couple pictures we're going to put up on the screen here. Um, and so, guys, you can put those up there. And uh, this was all that was part of these two families back in that day. As a matter of fact, you guys weren't married yet. Is that right? Um, so 2014. Um, so anyway, um, believe it or not, that's me right here on the left, and that's Timothy on the right. Believe it or not, that's, that's us. And uh, in September of 2014, we had planned a big trip to Walt Disney World. I'll never forget. Uh, I believe that was the same year we went to Atlanta. We went to Atlanta Braves game, and uh, we just had a great trip planned out. And the whole trip from Statesville, North Carolina to Orlando, Florida, we were just building up Disney World to Tim. I mean, we were telling Tim, man, you're not going to believe this. It was going to be his first time going to Disney, any Disney park. And on the way down, we're riding in the van together, and I'm like, and Hannah and all of us were telling Tim, I mean, you're going to love Disney. Uh, I mean, it's probably one of the cleanest places that you've ever been. I mean, you're going to have the most fun that you've ever had. I mean, the weather in Florida is usually really beautiful. And, and then the cast members of, of Disney World are just a step above the rest. And, man, they're going to make sure that you have a great time and that you have a lot of fun. And, I mean, Matt, we are building up Disney World to Tim. And we're building it up saying you are going to have the time of your life. Can I tell you something? It was the worst trip to Disney World that I have had to date. The weather was horrible. In fact, you may notice in that picture there's people walking around with uh, ponchos on because it was pouring down rain that day. Uh, the cast members at Disney World were as rude as they could possibly be. It, wasn't, it seemed to me on that day that it wasn't as clean as it normally was. And honestly, the hopes that we had put in Timothy's heart for a great Disney World experience came crashing down that day in 2014. And what I can guarantee you this, listen to me, as I attempt to expound the message of Malachi, here's what I can tell you. I, I won't be embellishing it. In fact, I don't think I can adequately explain from a merely human perspective what that day is going to be like. In fact, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. What I can guarantee you is this, I'm not overselling the day of Jesus' return. That day, that day will be a day unlike any other great day that you've ever experienced before. Why? Five reasons. Let me give them to you quickly. Number one, reason number one, we will be his cherished possession. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to preach a little bit today, but I'm going to teach a little bit today, too. So I need you to do your best to hang with me as I as we try to go a little bit deeper into the word of God today. I want you to look at verse number 17 of our text, Malachi 3.17. God says, and they shall be mine. Um, interesting statement there. In fact, it pro provides and really produces a question for us to say, who will be yours, Lord? Who is the they that is referred to in Malachi 3.17? And the answer is found in the context. It is referring to the remnant. 
It is referring to those who at the time of Malachi's prophecy were living in the midst of a majority of people who were disobedient and rebellious to God's word, incredulous and skeptical of his coming, disrespectful and dishonoring in their so-called worship of God. And God says to those living in that day, those who feared me, verse 16, those who spoke often one to another, encouraging one another, and those that feared my name and thought upon my name, the day is coming, God says to that group of people, when you will be mine. But that also provides another question for us to ask. And I had to ask myself this question, Lord, aren't we already yours? Don't we already belong to you? And the answer to that is yes. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18. We recognize that the church those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Peter said, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Paul said in Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And so what did Malachi mean? When he, when, or really, what did God mean when he said, and you, the remnant, shall be mine? Well, in one sense of the word uh, redemption, the word redeemed means to be released on receipt of a ransom. What that basically means is that the price that God demanded, which was the blood of a perfect sacrifice, I'm glad to report to you this morning, that price has been paid by Jesus, our Redeemer. We who have put our faith in Jesus have been released from the bondage and the slavery of sin. I've got a lot to give you today, and so I'm going to try my best to continue moving. But the Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary summed up the doctrine of redemption like this. Try to get this in your heart this morning. Devoted by sin to the justice of God, the church of the firstborn is redeemed from sin and the curse with Christ's precious blood. In all these passages, there is the idea of substitution, the giving of one for another by way of a ransom or equivalent. Man is sold under sin as a slave, shut up under condemnation and the curse. The ransom was therefore paid to the righteously incensed judge and was accepted as a vicarious satisfaction for our sin by God, inasmuch as it was his own love as well as righteousness which appointed it. An Israelite sold as a bondservant for debt might be redeemed by one of his brethren. As therefore we could not redeem ourselves, Christ assumed our nature in order to become our nearest of kin and brother, and so our God, our Redeemer. Hebrews 9.12 says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. I'm glad to report to you, and you ought to be excited about it. This is a good place to say amen this morning. We have been purchased out of the slavery of sin by the precious blood of Christ. The church is the purchased possession of Jesus Christ. We are his. We belong to him. Easton's Bible Dictionary said the debt against us is not viewed as simply canceled, but is fully paid. Christ's blood or life which he surrendered for them is the ransom by which the deliverance of his people from the servitude of sin and from its penal consequences is secured. Needless to say this morning, based on those scriptures we read, we who have put our faith in Jesus Christ have been redeemed. Jesus has paid the price. We belong to him this morning. But did you know in the Bible there's another sense of the doctrine of, the, of redemption in which we have been purchased, purchased, but we have yet to be claimed? Take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 1. Again, a little bit of a Bible study today, but I think this is going to build some anticipation in our hearts today. God says, you will be mine on that day. Lord, aren't we already yours? yes. We are his through the redemption of the blood of Jesus. But look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13. The Bible tells us we are waiting for the day of redemption. In whom, I'm in verse 13, Ephesians 1 13. In whom, that is in Jesus, ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 
which is the earnest. That's the down payment of our inheritance until, look at this, the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Have you ever found something online that you just thought, I've got to have that? And you didn't want anybody else to get it. It was first come, first serve. And so what did you do? You said, I'm going to go ahead and pay the price right now. I haven't come and claimed it yet. I haven't picked it up from the owner. But I'm going to go ahead and send you the money. I'm going to go ahead and make that down payment. And when you put that payment, uh, when you sent that payment, you purchased that. And technically, it became your possession upon the payment when it was made. But then you still had to go and claim that which was rightfully yours. Well, the Bible teaches that the church is the purchased possession of Christ, and it is yet to be claimed. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. The Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until that day of redemption. We are looking forward with hope to the day when Jesus comes again, for that will be a day of redemption when we will be claimed by him. John Gill, commenting on Malachi 3.17, said the remnant will be claimed and owned by Christ. And I want you to notice the wording in our text today. He refers to the remnant as his jewels. Did you see that in verse number 17? They shall be mine, the Bible says. The Bible says that they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Can I tell you what that word means? The word jewels refers to valued property. Whereas we said it means his treasured possession. Matthew Poole defines it as that which I highly value and keep most safely. I have good news for you this morning. That is how God views you in Christ. His jewels. Stop believing the lie that you're worthless. I promise you, if you have that feeling that you're worthless or that your life has no value, that is not coming from God. The Bible says that in Christ we are his jewels. Stop believing that God doesn't care about you. Stop believing that God doesn't love you. Listen, I know he loved you because he paid the highest price for you when he shed his own blood for you. 1 John 3.16 says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. Albert Barnes said this, for as in the old law, Israel was a special treasure, a special people, and inheritance of God chosen out of all nations. So in the new law, Christians and those who are righteous through grace are the special treasure of God. And in heaven shall be his special treasure and glory possessed by God and possessing God. Why will this day be a day of joy? Here's why. Because we will be his cherished possession. Number two. We will be, I love this, everybody stay real calm as I tell you this, all right, this morning. We will be, here, we, uh, we will be completely perfected. Not only will we be God's cherished possession, I mean, imagine that. The eternal God of heaven values you as a jewel. But we will also be completely perfected, notice in verse 17, in that day when I make up my jewels. Those two English words, make up, are one Hebrew word which means to accomplish. And it indicates to us that there is a process taking place that will ultimately be completed or accomplished on the day of the coming of the Lord. This is referring to the perfecting process by which a jewel is purified. In fact, look back with me in Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 2 quickly. We are kind of given exactly what's going to happen in this time leading up to the coming of Christ. Malachi 3, verse number 2 through 3. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. There is coming a day when we will be completely purified, completely purged, but that day has not come yet. We are still in the fiery trials of life. The reality is we are still facing moments just like Job where God allows us to go through difficult days and diff difficult moments and difficult seasons of our life in order that he might purify his jewels. I remind you of the Jameson Fawcett Brown uh, commentary quote that I used earlier in the study of this passage. When they said that the purifier sits before the crucible, fixing his eye on the metal, 
and taking care that the fire be not too hot and keeping the metal in only until he knows the dross to be completely removed by seeing his own image reflected in the glowing mass. That is what's happening in your life today. You know what that tells me? Every trial that we face has meaning. Every bad day that you face has a purpose. What I'm telling you is this. God is using every part of your life to purify you and to make you more like Jesus Christ. Theologically, there are two truths that sound like they conflict or they contradict one another, but they're back actually working in sync together. On the one hand, we can make this statement, I am sanctified. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can declare this morning, I am sanctified. That means you've been set apart. What do I mean by that? I mean that uh, you've been justified or declared righteous positionally in Christ Jesus. This is good news this morning. When God sees me, he sees a person who has been absolutely and totally forgiven of every sin. When God sees me positionally this morning, he sees a man that is dressed in the righteousness of my Savior, Jesus Christ. I am accepted by God because of the finished work of my Savior, Jesus. I am sanctified, set apart in Christ. But you know it's also true to say that I am being sanctified? And this is the progressive work that will continue in my life until the day when the Lord comes in the clouds and I am given a glorified body. Paul told the Philippian church, look at this, that he was confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry said this, the work of grace will never be perfected till the day of Jesus Christ, the day of his appearance, but we may always be confident God will perform his good work in every soul wherein he has really begun it by regeneration. But I, I, I needed to lay that out there first of all this morning, but I said all of that to say something. Don't miss the point of Malachi's message today because Malachi is encouraging the remnant. I am encouraging the remnant today by reminding you, listen, there's coming a day when the work of sanctification will be over. There's coming a day when the work of sanctification will be accomplished. That ought to bless you guys this morning. Listen, you know what that tells me, Ms. Sanchez? No more fiery trials. No more going into the furnace of life because on that day we will be fully and completely glorified. We will be fully and completely sanctified. We will be perfected completely on that day. Listen to what John said in 1 John 3, 2 through 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And I love this last part because it speaks into that conflict that I'm talking about. Look what he says right here. And and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. I believe that's exactly what I was trying to explain earlier, that there's that positional sanctification. I am pure in Christ, and yet I am being purified by God through the daily trials of my life. But thanks be to God, there's a day coming. Today might be the day when we are fully and completely sanctified in Christ. No more fiery trials, no more sanctifying process, no more faults, no more failures, no more discipline. We will be like him and the work will be complete. And I say to that, thanks be to God. And I look forward to that day with a, with a hope in my heart. Because I don't know about you, but I've messed up this week. And I had to go to God and say, God, I'm sorry, I'm, I shouldn't have done that. And I was wrong for that. And my heart was grieved this week by some things that I did. And I had to confess my sins to God. But man, I'm looking forward to a day when I won't have to confess my sins anymore. I'll be like him. It'll be a great day. Number three, quickly. I've got to go quickly through this. But let me say number three. Malachi tells us that we will be compassionately preserved. Look what he says in verse 17. And I will spare them. That's an important word. As a man spareth his own son. That serveth him. This is where we're going to go a little deep. I need you to stay with me for a moment. This is a blessed truth that we need to engage our minds to understand today. And it is this. When Jesus comes in the clouds, this earth and the people living on this earth will endure the wrath of God. 
In fact, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 3, they'll put it on the screen for you this morning, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. What is this day of the Lord that Paul is referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? There are a, a, a host of different opinions, but one thing is certain, and that's where we're going to kind of just land right there today, and that is this. The day of the Lord will be a day of great judgment. Warren Wiersbe said the day of the Lord is the time when God will judge the world and punish the nations. The Home and Study Bible says this phrase, uh, says that this phrase, the day of the Lord, often signifies a time of God's wrath and judgment poured out in an uncommon way. I need everybody to listen real closely to me this morning. According to 1 Thessalonians 5 and other portions of Scripture, listen, there is coming a day when God will send great judgment unlike any judgment that this world has ever seen before. And by the way, God has sent judgment to this world before. Has everybody listen to me this morning? Everybody read Genesis chapter 6 when God flooded the whole earth? Out of judgment. Has anybody read about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained down fire and brimstone? We'll look at Matthew 24, 21, where Jesus says that this day, the day of great tribulation, will be such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. The word Paul uses in 1 Thessalonians 5 is the word destruction. It literally means to destroy to ruin. And that's precisely what's going to happen in the days following the return of Jesus Christ. Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 13, 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate. He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. That's how serious this day is going to be. Dr. J. Vernon McGee said the great tribulation will get underway when the church leaves the earth. The one event of the rapture will end the day of grace and begin the day of the Lord. It closes one day and it opens another. So just how bad will the day of tribulation, the time of tribulation be? Jesus summarized these events in Matthew 24. I want you to look at them closely. These are the words of Jesus, not the words of Zach. Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8. And Jesus says, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. As difficult as it may be to believe the first part of the seven-year tribulation the, the, the first part of that tribulation, of, of believed to be approximately three and a half years, will resemble peace as compared to what lies ahead. Jesus refers to it in our text here, in this, in this verse, as the beginning of sorrows. Meaning that, uh, referring to the birth pangs before labor pangs begin. John prophesied in the book of Revelation that there will be 21 specific judgments that will be sent upon the earth during the time of tribulation. He divided them into three categories, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials. In Revelation, uh, we read about that in Revelation chapter 6 through 18. Jesus summarized in Matthew 24, 29, and he, he said, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Theologian John Walford said, All of the elements of a great catastrophic judgment of God of God are here present, namely a great earthquake, the sun becoming black, the moon becoming as blood, the stars of heaven falling like ripe figs, the heaven departing as a scroll, and every mountain and island moving. This is an awe-inspiring scene. I've got many more things I could say. I don't have time to say it. But I'll tell you what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, they shall not escape. There will be no way for mankind to avoid that divine judgment that God will pour out on this earth. But I have great news for you guys this morning. 
It's the same news that Paul had for the church in Thessalonica and the same news that Malachi had for the remnant. Are you ready for this? We will be spared from this judgment. Paul told the church at Thessalonica, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Look at this. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, edify one another, even as also ye do. Look what Malachi said in our text. God says, you shall be mine and I will spare them as a man spares his own son. The word spare literally means to refrain from inflicting something on someone. You and I have nothing to fear this morning. We have the hope of salvation. We will be spared. Jesus Christ endured God's wrath on our behalf so we will never have to endure it. That was a weak amen right there. And I told you, my ability to communicate this is going to play into it. Do you guys realize how bad the time of tribulation is going to be? And yet, because of Jesus, we will be spared. He will rescue us out. We will be spared from that time of judgment on the earth. We praise God that he will compassionately preserve us during that time of trouble. Number four, quickly. I'm really happy to tell you the day of the coming of the Lord will be a day when we will have constant peace. Constant peace. Look at our text, verse number 18 now. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Jump down to verse number chapter 4, verse 2. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. I believe this is a clear reference to the time in which Jesus is going to return to this earth to set up his kingdom. And what a day that's going to be. But to set up the goodness of that day, can we talk about right now? Let's be honest and admit that the world seems to have the upper hand right now. By the way, key word of that statement was seems. Because there's a God in heaven who is sovereign and on his throne. There's nothing happening in our world today that's caught him by surprise. Everything is going right according to his plan. But from a human perspective, sometimes it may seem that things are out of control. Right now, let's be honest, wicked men are in powerful places. The agenda of our world and its course is clear. This is the message of the world right now. We are going to do what we want to do, and we will even do it with pride. We don't care what the Bible says. We don't believe there's a God. We are our own gods. We make our own rules, and we will do what we feel like doing, and we will march through the streets, and we will put it on every sign uh, in every mall, and we'll put it on social media, and we'll put it in our logos and in our graphics that we are our own gods, and we do what we want to do, and we take pride because we're going to do what we want to do, how we want to do it. We don't care what the Bible says. We don't care what God says. We will live how we want to live. It reminds me of what Paul said about the the Ephesians before they got saved, calling them children of disobedience, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. Does that sound like a fair summary of the mentality of our world today? I think it does. By the way, can I tell you something? Right now, especially in other parts of the world, it's not a very peaceful existence for believers. In fact... While we maintain a level of freedom to worship according to the dictates of Scripture, many today are enduring unspeakable persecution. Let me give you an example quickly. Forbes.com published an article in January of 2022, this year. And this was the title of the article. One in seven Christians, Christian minorities under, uh, one in seven Christian minorities under threat in 2022. This is the opening paragraph of the article. Listen to me as I give this to you. On January 19th, 2022, Open Doors, an international NGO advocating on behalf of persecuted Christians, released their annual World Watch List. The World Watch List assesses 50 countries where Christians face the most severe types of persecution. The newly published data reveals significant changes in the situation of Christian minorities around the world. Listen to this and look at it on the screen. According to the research, the persecution of Christians has reached the highest levels since the World Watch list began nearly 30 years ago. 
across 76 countries, more than 360 million Christians suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith, an increase of 20 million since last year. They went on to say 312 million Christians live in the top 50 uh, countries alone. Listen to this. One in every seven Christians live under at least high levels of persecution or discrimination for their faith. And I, this is not popular preaching, and so I'm just going to give it to you the way God put it on my heart and the way I think it's revealed in Scripture. But I believe this. The closer we come to the return of Jesus Christ, the more difficult it's going to become to follow him. I'm not going to get up here and paint a rosy picture and make you think that, oh, if I trust in Christ and follow Jesus, that I'll have health and wealth and prosperity. The reality is, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Listen, I'm not trying to be pessimistic this morning, but I am being realistic we are living in a culture that is becoming increasingly anti-christian look around you and you'll see clearly that the values and morals of scripture are becoming more and more controversial and antithetical to the mindset of our world today and yet you and i are called to stand for the truth jude said that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. But as we do, we must accept that we may be persecuted for our stand. This persecution should press us. Come on. This persecution should press us further in to our blessed hope. The worse the persecution becomes, the more we look forward with joy to the day. Oh, we look forward and say, guys, the day is coming when Jesus is coming. The day is coming when Jesus Christ will rule and he will reign. The day is coming when his principles and his values, the values of the word of God, will be the law of the land. That day is coming. We are in the minority right now, but there's coming a day when we will be the majority. As Malachi put it, There's coming a day when we will return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Joseph Benson said this means that there's coming a day when we will see clearly and distinguish perfectly. How many of you know that's not possible for us today? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Matthew Henry said, at the bar of Christ, every man's character will be known. In the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, we won't be misled by mere men who claim to be something that they're actually not. There, look at me. There will be no more fake Christians on that day. We'll be able to discern between the righteous and the wicked. But I want to show you one more thing that I found interesting, and I'm just about done, so stay with me. Look at verse number 2 of chapter 4. Malachi takes this one step further when he says this, You shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. I don't know how many of you are familiar with cows or calves, but one thing I think we can all know is that cows were not intended to be kept in stalls. Cows most naturally love to be free to graze on the hillside. But it's interesting to me that Malachi uses that analogy to describe the Christian in the current culture and the current context. In some ways we are in some ways we haven't experienced the fullness of our freedom. Wearsby said on that day it will be a day like calves let out of their stalls. Think about this. That's where cows find their joy. That's where they find their rest and their freedom is grazing on that hillside. And while we may endure persecution for living for Christ today, listen to me. There's coming a day when we will be released in the glory of God to live for him for all of eternity. John MacArthur said the picture of a calf being released from the stall is one of a joyful, vigorous, and carefree life. I just said all that to tell you something. The day is coming. That day is coming. When 
The day is coming when we will be his cherished possession, when we will be completely perfected, when we will be compassionately preserved, when we will have constant peace. And here's the last thing, and I've got to do this quickly. We will have Christ's protection. Look at chapter 2, chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness. Notice the word Son is capitalized, referring to a person. This is referring to Jesus Christ. The Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Wearsby said, when the Son of Righteousness arises, it will either mean burning or blessing. Through all of eternity. Come on, there is coming a day. I just got to tell you guys something. Through all of eternity, there is coming a day when we will spend the rest of eternity in the presence and under the protection of Almighty God. The psalmist said in Psalm 16, 11, in thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. And I'm telling you this morning, there is a day coming when we will experience the fullness of that joy. There is a day coming when we will be at his right hand and we will experience his pleasures forevermore. In the presence and in the protection of God, our Savior. The Holman Study Bible said, as a bird's wings offer protection, God's wings will bring healing to his children who will never again fear the wicked. Hannah, will you come up for a second, please? We're going to sing a song for you really quick. <clears throat> I know I studied for this message this week, and I know I'm like in my own thoughts, in my own mind. I'm thinking, God, I cannot communicate to your people the glory of that day. And I, I don't know that it's possible on this side of heaven to try to use our words to communicate it to, to you. But I just want to encourage you. Maybe you've been experiencing trials. You've been going through the fires of life and you've been being sanctified. The day is coming when those fiery trials will be passed. Maybe you've been experiencing disease or some sort of affliction. The day is coming when those things will be a, 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 a past thought. Maybe you've been experiencing persecution of some sort, and I'm here to tell you the day is coming when there will be no more persecution. There will be no more uh, people having uh, to receive uh, uh, shame and indignation for standing for the Lord Jesus Christ. That day is coming. I'm going to sing a song, and Hannah's going to help me sing this song this morning called while the ages roll. And will you just let your imagination think upon the truth of Scripture as we sing this song this morning? Someday this stammering tongue will falter no more and a grander, sweeter song I shall sing. Then I'll join the ransom choir on heaven's bright shore forever to praise the King. And while the ages roll, I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow. My song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while angels shall roll. When a million years have passed in that wonderful place, my song of praise will just have begun and my joy will never end while I look on his face and my song will never be done and while the ages roll I'll keep on praising him and my voice will never tire or grow old. And my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me. And I'll sing it while ages shall roll. 
my song shall ever be. Praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll. Hey, the day's coming. Let's bow our heads this morning. The day is coming. I don't think we're going to have the worship team come just because I went so late. But right before we leave today, hey, can we just take a second and love his appearing? We talked about that last week. I believe Paul dwelt upon this reality of what we talked about today. I'm talking about the Apostle Paul who endured stripes and beatings and persecution and suffering. And yet he continued on because, you know why? Because he knew the day was coming when Jesus was going to come. And he could say to Timothy, as he was getting ready to lose his head in Rome, Paul could say, Timothy, there's coming a day when the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give me a crown of rejoicing. Not to me only, but to, uh, unto all them also that love his appearing. Hey, I want to comfort you with these words this morning. Jesus is coming. Hey, teenagers, as you're, bow, as you're sitting with your heads bowed, Jesus is coming. We don't have time to back up. We don't have time to slow down. We don't have time to waste 5, 10, 15 years out of God's will. Hey, Jesus is coming. I want to comfort you with those words today. Hey, are you part of the rebellion? Hey, I want to convict you with those words today. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Are you part of the remnant? I want to comfort you with those words today. Jesus is coming. The day is coming. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to preach your word today. I pray it's been a help and a challenge. We covered a lot of territory today. But Lord, we look forward to the day when we will be your cherished possession. I can't fathom what that's going to be like. Lord, we'll be your jewels. Complete. Perfected. Lord, you're going to... It's just hard for me to even imagine because Lord, I'm a sinner and don't deserve your love. But because of the forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ that you've offered me, you will, Lord, you, you will express your love to me throughout all of eternity. I can't fathom that. There's coming a day when we will be completely perfected, no more faults and failures, no more fiery trials. Lord, we long for that day. There's coming a day when we will be compassionately preserved. We thank you for the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. Salvation from hell but salvation from tribulation. Thank you, God, that there's coming a day when we will have constant peace. And while the wicked are in rule today, and it seems that we are in the minority, there's coming a day when believers will be in the majority. And Lord, we thank you for your, the day that is coming when we will have the protection of Christ as we will dwell into eternity without any fear of ever being lost or of spending eternity separated from you, we will dwell with you forever. We look forward to that day, God. It's with great hope that we long for that day. And it brings joy to know that that day is coming. So help us this week as we face trials and difficulties and maybe even as we face persecution to look forward to the day, for the day is coming. We pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Well, I hope you are, I hope you are comforted by those words today and uh, the truth of Scripture. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Let's look for him this week, and uh, we're going to be dismissed in a word of prayer. Thank you for being here. I apologize for going a little bit over. I hope you have a wonderful week, and let's take some time to fellowship with each other as we leave this morning. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Let's all stand together, and don't forget, as you leave today, uh, we are having another bake sale for our teenagers, and so if you could help them out with that. We also have some more of those revival books out here on the front, uh, in the front lobby, and so you can grab one of those as you leave today. Hey, the day is coming. And let's look for him this week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, Lord, I, I just, uh, I, I regret that I don't have the words uh, or the ability to communicate that truth with more clarity. And Lord, with a little bit more vitality and with a little bit more expression. But Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit would work in our hearts this week to help us long for the day when Jesus comes. Lord, uh, I pray this week that we'll live with the truth of the the return of Christ in our minds, and that will live for your glory this week. Help us to live for you this week. Help us to be good witnesses wherever we go. Help us to love one another and encourage one another. 
And uh, Lord, may you work in and through us. Dismiss us with your blessing, we pray, and give us a great week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day.